programming is and um, and what it's like working there, and and hopefully give you uh, give you a bit of an idea what what it's like uh, doing this. Um, yeah, so I already did a little bit of, uh, about me. Um, so I'm Omar. I, I'm currently working as a graphics engineer uh, at Snapchat. Uh, I've been here for about a year. Um, I'm based in Ithaca, New York. Uh, I grew up in Egypt. And I kind of, um, I, start, I started learning this program kind of making uh, Flash games, uh, if you ever played that back in the day, or, or just any like uh, online web games. Um, and you can always learn more about me or reach out uh, at my website here, uh, omarshihata.me. Um, so, so what I want to go over today is just to kind of explain like what is um, 3D or graphics programming more, more generally as, as a field um, and what types of jobs um, are, uh, are part of this field. And then kind of in the second half, uh, I want to see if we can have time to, to do a little bit of hands-on, um, a little mini project uh, that you can actually follow along um, just to see what it's like kind of day in the life, um, like doing a little bit uh, of, of actual like, graphics programming and, and what that looks like. Um, so, so what is graphics programming? It's, generally speaking, it's a, it's a subfield of computer science that, that studies like essentially putting things on, on the screen. Um, and 3D programming uh, falls under that umbrella of the more general uh, graphics programming. Um, so just to give you some concrete examples, like what, what does that mean? Um, the biggest, the most common example you might be aware of is like video games, like writing software um, that, that visualizes these like 3D models that move around, that jump, that have all these uh, animated effects. Um, or not just video games, but also like animated movies, like Pixar movies and, and animated Disney movies uh, as well. But also things that people uh, use every day, like, like Photoshop or like Adobe Illustrator, like things that either manipulate photos um, or like create digital art. Um, the, the people who make those software are people who are working in, in graphics, uh, are graphics programmers um, that create the software to make it possible to do uh, those manipulations. Uh, but even something that you might not, it might not seem like it's in the same field, like mapping software, like Google Maps or Google Earth. Uh, those are also very heavy, um, make heavy use of computer graphics because a big part of that, those applications is you have a lot of data, um, mapping data, and you want to represent that uh, on, the screen uh, in a way that's um, efficient, um, but also um, uh, intuitive. Um, another one is, uh, another big one is, is people doing like um, architecture, like architects who will may maybe drop some plans of a building, uh, they'll use like CAD software, which, which is uh, short for like computer aided design. Um, and that's something that's, that's almost like one of the earliest things that people have done with, with computers. Um, so you'll have, uh, you'll have like a blueprint or something. And instead of maybe in the old days, you, you, you draw that on, I mean, people still, I think do this, like draw it on, on uh, pen and paper, uh, but also having the model on a computer uh, allows you to, to see it in 3d, um, and to see a lot of uh, information uh, that goes along with it as well. Um, and also a lot of simulation, uh, work, like a lot of people that work, have been working on like self-driving cars or, or drones, um, or even things even older than that, like uh, training pilots, uh, like simulation software has been a critical part of, of any pilot's training, um, I think for a very long time, even before like personal computers were a thing and, and still continues uh, to be a, an important part um, of, of their training. Um, so a lot of this stuff is very visual. So I wanted to kind of show you um, examples of, of what people are doing um, in computer graphics. And so this video I have is from um, it's from SIGGRAPH 20, 2019. SIGGRAPH is, a, is the biggest computer, it's the biggest conference for computer graphics. And so what you're going to see here is, a, is a, just the highlights of some of like the cutting edge research that people are, are actively working on right now in the field of computer graphics. Now, just to give you an idea of, of like, you know, where the field is and what kind of problems people work on or like what research in this field looks like. This video highlights just a few clips from the amazing work to be found in the SIGGRAPH 2019 Technical Papers program. Animating dynamic fracture based on continuum damage mechanics allows us to more realistically break bread together. An implicit octree discretization supports spatially varying viscosity to efficiently simulate melting this chocolate bunny. An implicit material point method simulates materials with a broad range of elasticity, including creamy, dense, and delicious looking fluids. Real ferrofluids produce complex and surprising behavior, and a new simulation method accurately reproduces these effects. 
A new map that models realistic large-scale ecosystems of trees and other plants, and in this example the system progresses over many hundreds of years. A new control method coupled with a comprehensive musculoskeletal system produces realistic acrobatic human movement. A new interface for space-time control makes it easy to adjust keyframe animations for natural looking motion. This low-cost stretch sensing glove can interactively estimate hand pose without any external optical components. Now someone can interactively edit a pattern that can be executed on a knitting machine to make a custom sweater for a bunny. By guiding someone to take a grid of photos, a new light field method can render captured scenes with amazing fidelity, even on a phone. A portrait photo taken with a regular cell phone can be quickly relit as if it had been captured in a different lighting environment. Using a simple proxy model of this pyramid made from internet photos allows us to easily adjust the lighting in this drone footage. This deep generative model lets a user edit a photo with high-level concepts like clouds, grass, and brick rather than with pixel colors. A new method lets me edit this video of myself simply by waving my magic wand. Oh wait, that's not right. A new method lets me edit this video of myself by editing the transcript. That's better. Supervised directly from MultiView 2D imagery shown on the left, this neural network learns an animatable 3D model that can be rendered in novel views. This system can reproduce the facial expressions of someone wearing a VR headset, supporting remote social interactions in immersive environments. By waving this magic wand, now video like this can be stylized to match a hand-drawn exemplar with excellent fidelity and temporal coherence. It seamlessly matches the hand-drawn keyframes on the left. Come to the SIGGRAPH 2019 Technical Papers program to learn about these and many other amazing results. So that's a bit of a taste about um, some of the applications that people are, are working on today. And you can see kind of uh, a huge range of things, um, like, for example, here when they were talking about um, sort of digital image manipulation. This is more like uh, Photoshop, uh, you know, you're manipulating a static image, uh, but also something that uh, I think like the newer versions of Photoshop have been doing uh, recently. This idea of you want to put a tree here instead of like manually you know, cropping a tree and, and moving it, uh, you can just kind of draw and then it'll, it'll just kind of generate a, a tree there or, or a door or, or something like that, uh, which, which feels a bit like magic to me. Because uh, a, a lot of this recent stuff is, is like machine learning combined with computer graphics as well. Um, so another one. Oh, this one I was going to mention is also a good example of um, tools um, designed for, like I said, people making like Pixar movies. So this one, what, what they were explaining here is instead of like if, if you wanted to animate someone doing this jump into like a pool, um, traditionally you would have to animate it uh, frame by frame and try to make it as realistic as possible, which is very hard. Uh, so a scene like this could take weeks uh, of manual, you know, moving every bone and every uh, piece of the arm and every um, you know, the leg and so on. Um, but the, the software here tries to sort of predict like what a, what a human being would, would look like and, and sort of give you a, traje a trajectory that you can then edit as an animator. Um, so that could save you a lot of time. Um, yeah, so those are a couple of good examples. Um, and sort of one, one distinction I'd like to make, just to make it even clearer, like what, what, what exactly computer graphics is, um, is so what, what I get kind of asked this question a lot. Um, it, like if what I do is like kind of similar to like graphic designer, like what's the difference between like saying graphic design and, and computer graphics? Um, Cause you know, they both have the, the word graphic in them. Um, but one, one easy way uh, to think about this is uh, graphic design is more like you know, using Photoshop. So using these tools to actually make digital art or, or manipulate photos. Uh, or, or, or actually produce the final uh, work. Um, computer graphics is often kind of a level uh, beneath that. Uh, it is, it would be in this case, like actually making Photoshop. So writing the software that makes the tool um, that can, um, you know, to give you a small example, like uh, that can turn an image black and white or that can like blur an image or that can you know, do some of these fancier, um, you know, fill in a tree or, or, or add in a dynamically generated door or something. Um, 
I think I'll I'll skip this and get back to it because um, I, I think I have a more exciting demo uh, towards the end. Um, so to, so to give you some um, some things that make graphics programming uh, as a field or working in it um, unique um, are that one big thing is that a lot of the code that you're writing um, it runs on the GPU as opposed to most software generally or most code uh, we most code that we all write generally runs on the CPU uh, you know and there's a lot of nice things about the CPU um, code is generally sequential uh, except when when you explicitly are using like multiple threads. Um, but there, there's a fun video here that Mythbusters uh, have done to, to ex visually explains the difference here. So if you were to try to draw uh, an image on the computer, uh, on the CPU traditionally, and this is how it was done before GPUs uh, or thing, um, it, would, it would look like this. You know, you're drawing one pixel at a time, uh, in this case, one paintball at a time until you finish the image. Uh, by contrast, a GPU uh, does the idea of a GPU is it's a piece of hardware uh, in the computer that is made for very quickly drawing images on the screen. Uh, and so it does this by doing everything in parallel. So if it wanted to draw an image, uh, you know, it would look like this. It would be this giant can um, that instead of one paintball at a time, it would be like a thousand at the same time. Um, and it's kind of fun to watch to see. See how this works here. So they're they're going to fire it. We have a little countdown. Three, two, one. Yeah. And then boom, you know, just in 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 essentially like in in the time that the CPU would have taken to maybe draw a single one, um, it would have done all of the all of the screen. Um, so this is this is important because this is the thing that makes um, GPUs really fast, and it's also the thing that makes computer graphics or graphics programming uh, working in it um, different and difficult, uh, gen like just, or slightly more difficult than than working with uh, um, on a CPU. Because if you it, like, as an example, if you wanted to, um, like, you can't use a debugger in the same way on the GPU they can on the CPU because everything just happens at the same time. You can't pause the program. You can't put a print statement, you know, in the middle um, before it finishes because again, every, everything just kind of happens uh, in parallel. Um, so, so this is a good mental model to, to kind of keep in mind. Um, and then kind of as a follow-up, a lot of times, especially if you're working with interactive applications, like, um, like I said, like whether it's video games or like mapping software, a lot of times it's something or ar architecture software um, it's the user is actively engaging with with the with the software. It's not like a it's not like a movie or an animated movie where the animator can can make it and then you can you can leave the you can run the software overnight and then it gives you a final video. Um, in in those cases, that's all, it's called offline rendering. You can you can spend as much time as you want uh, rendering a scene, and that, that's actually why oftentimes uh, animated movies generally look much better than video games um, because you can spend as much time. In, in the software, um, you know, simulating every particle of light and, and doing all these um, nice effects that take a lot more computation, whereas uh, and things that have to be interactive, you often have to, your code, all of your code often has to run in less than 16 milliseconds. Um, and 16 milliseconds because um, that's, that's, that's the maximum it would need to take if you want to run at 60 frames per second. Um, so it's a very tight budget. So oftentimes, if you can make something like faster by like one millisecond, um, that that's actually pretty huge, uh, a pretty huge uh, performance boost. Um, and so the, the the last two things are the parts that I personally uh, really enjoy um, about this field. It's the, this idea that um, if you think about what you're actually trying to do with computer graphics, um, you're basically trying to learn about how the world works so that you can simulate it on a computer. Um, and, and, and particularly like visually. So a lot of it is, a lot of it's concerned with understanding like the physics of light and, and how light reflects off of different materials um, and how, how it behaves when it goes through something that's like transparent uh, and what happens and how it refracts and, and, and so on. So in fact, there's a good, um, there's a good kind of slide Hills, from a lecture here. Were... This is also, this is another, uh, like an hour-long talk, uh, also from SIGGRAPH, that conference I mentioned earlier, uh, where he's explaining 
uh, reflections. And so, and, and he's telling you here that the difference between these two materials, um, you know, you can see the top one is, is kind of shiny like a mirror. You can kind of like, if you're standing there, you can see your face more clearly. The bottom one um, isn't, isn't as shiny. Uh, so maybe the top one's like, you can imagine it's like a metal or something and this one, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't reflect as much. Um, the interesting part for me here is that, you know, this is an observation that anyone, you know, knows. You, you've, seen, you've seen reflective materials like, you know, um, like a mirror and, you, and you've seen things that aren't very reflective. Um, but you, as a graphics programmer, you have to understand why. Why, are, why is one thing more reflective than the other? Um, because you have to be able to um, put that in the simulation in order to have light uh, behave realistically. And, and so the reason um, is one of these materials, the top one, is a lot smoother uh, than, than the other. And, and this is not a smoothness that you can um, feel with your hands. Because right? both of them, if you touch them, they feel smooth. Uh, but these are like very small, tiny micro... Like if you look with a microscope, you'll notice one is smoother than the other. And that matters because for the first one, the, the lights, because of the small, because of the smoothness, um, the rays will mostly just reflect um, in the same way they came in with just a slight difference. Whereas the other one, because there's more microscopic bumps, uh, the lights will scatter and that's what blurs uh, the reflection. Um, and so we learn about you know, how the world works. Um, and then we take that understanding and then we put that into the software in order to have something that reflects uh, the world. Um, and so that, 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 that's, that's one thing I really, really appreciate about working here, working in this field generally. Um, Cause uh, this, this has happens all the time. And like um, the black and white thing that I was gonna mention that I might get to if we have time is another example because um, in order to figure out how to turn an image black and white correctly, you have to understand how humans, how our eyes work and how they perceive color. Um, because as an example, we don't, our eyes don't, um, we're not equally sensitive to all the colors. Uh, I think we are, what is it? We're more, we're more sensitive to red than we are to green. And, and there's a specific sort of formula um, that people have tested and that you can test yourself as well. Uh, and so you have to understand that in order to correctly um, in to, to make an application that turns things black and white. And this is something like Photoshop does as well. Um, so I think that's super interesting. And you know, I, it, there's not a lot of uh, computer science fields or subfields uh, that, that involve kind of learning so much about like, you know, our, not just the lights, physics and optics, but also our human bodies and, and, and how we perceive the world. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's very cool and very fun. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about jobs and, and how to actually, um, you know, do this type of work. Um, and so my, my background um, has been, uh, like I said, I, I worked a little bit in making video games, but mostly I've been working in, in the mapping industry in, in geospatial. Um, and I could probably talk about that for uh, a lot. And so th that's something I'm also happy if you have questions. We do have a Q&A uh, here, so feel free to drop any questions here. Uh, but my personal um, uh, career trajectory has sort of been, uh, as I've started learning um, how to make the, the, these video games with Flash uh, back in the day and then with JavaScript later on, um, I learned a lot about uh, these basic uh, ideas of like, okay, how do you use the GPU uh, to, to draw things on the screen? Um, and so as I'm starting to learn these fundamentals, uh, I, I realized I, I saw job openings that had, um, we're using the same um, uh, the same tools. And, and, and so I have a, a tip here in the bottom. Um, so these are examples of um, of technologies that uh, any job that involves graphics programming would likely have. Um, so if it's something like on the web, you would use WebGL. And so in like if you're, if you're not familiar with WebGL, it's, it's just like the library that you would use um, to run code on the GPU. Um, and, and OpenGL is the same thing, but it's for desktop applications. And Vulkan and Metal are again the same thing. These are all libraries or APIs that we use um, to to interact with the GPU, um, or, or even high level things like you know game engines like Unity and and, and Unreal Engine. Um, but anyway, so I, so as I started learning like these these basic uh, technologies that are used in in video games, and I saw job postings that had the same technologies like WebGL, um, and that was a lot of um, for me was was mapping software. 
<clears throat> yeah, and then so, and I was gonna add for me, mapping in particular was really fun. Um, just even you know more sub subfield um, because it 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 kept adding that um, it involved a lot of learning about the real world too in terms of like you know the the stuff that I'm simulating in the software in the mapping application uh, isn't just a video game but it's also it's it's a real place like almost everything in the map is a real place and then learning about how do we get that data uh, a lot of it is from satellites and um, well, how does the satellite send the data down and how does it get processed and how do we um, update that. Um, so I think that that's been a that's been a pretty fun um, uh, that's been a pretty fun career I think. Um, I was I was thinking of one uh, one fun anecdote um, that, I, that I think I can share here. Um, with the, on on one of these mapping softwares that I worked, um, there was a there was a unit test um, that always failed um, over lunch. Okay, so that's, you know, that's a little bit weird. I mean, actually, initially, it was just kind of flaky. You know, sometimes unit tests, when we have a lot of unit tests, especially on big software, uh, sometimes it would just fail. And, you know, uh, sometimes you just rerun it, and that's fine. But I started noticing that this particular unit test uh, always seemed to fail over lunch. And then if you try it after lunch, it works, uh, which is very bizarre. Like, why, why would that be the case? Um, and it turned out it was because what this unit test was doing is it was detecting if... Um, if you have this like uh, 3D model in, in, in the mapping software and it was detected, it, it checked that it's possible to change the color of it using the, a function to change the color. Um, but over lunch, it just happened to be that um, the sun, because the sun was directly overhead and the, because this material happened to be really shiny. Um, so um, the color would be white. This it wouldn't be the right color um, that you're trying to set it to. Um, so the unit test was failing because it was a mapping software that was simulating the real world. And in the real world, if the sun is directly overhead, uh, you get the shinier reflection on the material that you picked. Um, and so it failed. So, so that, that, that's just a, a fun example of, of how um, kind of real world tied a lot of the software, is, especially in, in, the mapping, um, in the mapping industry. Um, so, but, but I, have, uh, I have a couple of names here of, um, of, of, of companies, if you're interested in um, looking at like what kind of jobs are available. Uh, and I think it's always good, especially if you're earlier in your, in your career or earlier in your like uh, in college, because uh, I sort of did start doing this like freshman or um, sophomore year is to just look at the job postings, even if you're not ready to apply like full-time jobs, um, just look at what, what, what they're asking for as a way to sort of see what's something you can start to work towards. Um, Cause oftentimes um, if you can have, if you can make a project Maybe it's over the summer or over a semester or take a class that um, sort of hits one of their things that they're looking for uh, that that really sets you apart. Um, so examples of companies that um, regularly have a lot of uh, like mapping jobs in particular are uh, Esri, um, Mapbox, and Microsoft has an Azure Maps team. Um, Google has like their Google Maps team, um, and there's a couple others. But but really the best way I think um, to find these these graphics jobs. Um, are to do do a search for technologies like this, like WebGL, WebGPU, uh, OpenGL, and then you'll find um, yeah, and you'll you'll find job places like this. In fact, I think I did a kind of a experiment um, initially, and I found like this. This is an example. Um, this soft, this research and development, three D graphics engineer position at uh, the New York Times. Um, which I found just by searching WebGL, and and this is a this is a project where I guess they want. Um, actually, if you're, if you're not familiar, the New York Times does a lot of uh, interesting three um, D visualization work, and this is an example where I think this is like some kind of a historic site, and they wanted to give viewers uh, or readers a way to sort of explore that on the web. And so this is just a web page. I'm just scrolling through. Um, and they're they're visualizing all this on on the web using using WebGL. Um, so you know this sounds like a pretty cool job, and you know you can there's a lot of uh, similar jobs like that that just pop up just by looking for WebGL. Uh, cool. I think we have enough time. And uh, Tyler, just double check. Uh, it is an hour long. Uh, yep. Right. Cool. Um, and, and also, uh, Omar, yeah. to answer your question in the email, I did post a link to this slide deck in the announcements channel for anyone who wants to take a look at it later. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, great timing because we're about to we're about to do this. We're about to get into the uh, the hands on section. Um, and basically, what I'm going to do here, I have a, a link in the slide um, for a project that you can follow along with. We're going to make some small edits to it. Um, you're welcome to follow along. Um, really, can... really quickly before you get to that, you do have two questions in the Q and A. If you are up for it, yes, um, I was going to do that. So while while you go look for the ah, cool. slides, uh, yeah, I'll take a look at the questions here. That's a good question. We have a question from uh, Nikolai about uh, what what skills are required to, um, to do mapping. Um, there's a couple of ways you can you can tackle it. Um, you can come into it from the, the computer graphics perspective. Um, so as long as you are um, you've built the skills on how to um, visualize a, a large number of uh, a large amount of data um, quickly, and so that that's like the same skill you would have if you're making video games. Um, so you could, those skills are are directly transferable to to, to mapping. Um, so you could, you could get a mapping job with that background. Um, and you would just learn a lot of the, the mapping side of stuff uh, on on the job. Um, you could also do it the other way, where you you focus more on um, like the geospatial side or the mapping side or the, or the cartography side, um, and that that's a bit more niche. But um, let's see, you would so like like as an example, like you, you could learn um, how people um, get access to large uh, like. Uh, mapping data sets, um, like for example, satellite imagery and where people download that and and how uh, and how to manipulate that, like for example, how to cut it up. Or, or one example is um, there's a lot of uh, elevation data. So if you if you're making an application where you have drones that are flying, uh, it's or, fly, or planes or anything, it's often important to to see like uh, to have the terrain, like the, the mountains and the valleys and all that. Um, so that that's all 3D data. So learning uh, how to work with that, like making a project that involves, um, you know, either even just visualizing that. Um, yeah, and a lot of that actually can be slightly less like programming and more like data manipulation and learning how to use different softwares. And like, one, one, one example of a good software uh, is, is QGIS. Uh, so it's QGIS. Um, so if you, know, if you look up um, QGIS tutorial on YouTube or anything, um, that would be a good kind of place to start about uh, how what are the tools that map people in map in, in the mapping industry use and, and where can you go from there. Um, and another question is how heavy are how math heavy are graphics jobs in general? Um, I would say it's definitely um, it definitely involves more math than um, than most uh, most like generic software jobs I'd say like like building web apps. Um, but also it's not like the kind of math. It's it's like a different kind of math. So, for example, like I, in high school and college, I was very bad at calculus, and I think if that was the only like math I was ever exposed to, I'd be like, oh, I am just not good at math. Um, but um, the the math that you often use in in computer graphics and in these visual applications is stuff that's more like uh, linear algebra. Um, and I even even I hesitate saying this because like learning linear algebra like on paper feels very different from learning it in in for the purposes of like manipulating a three D environment. Um, because I it didn't really click for me until I started like making games. And I was like, oh, all this stuff actually makes much more sense because I have this this matrix bunch of numbers. It's not just a bunch of numbers; they're actually representing like rotation, and and I and you know this is how uh, it's supposed to be applied. Um, so so that's kind of the kind of math. Um, but I say this with a caveat of like, don't let that um, be a barrier if if you haven't been if you haven't been uh, if you haven't enjoyed other kind of math classes you've taken. Um, so looking at another question here. Um, I think doing, so the question is, does doing uh, graphics research in undergrad uh, help uh, with finding a job and how tough are these positions to get? Um, having any kind of, I think, experience with uh, graphics, whether it's whether it's like research, which would be really cool, um, or even just uh, something high level, which, which is what we'll do in a little bit here, um, of like actually just using a game engine to make something. Um, I think helps a lot um, because it, it's just something that not a lot of people have experience with. And in terms of how tough um, these jobs are to get, and I have like a slide with advice at the end. Um, it's not it's not as easy as getting like a job um, making web apps because there's just a lot more jobs uh, doing that kind of stuff. 
Um, and and like my advice, and this is sort of what I've done in my career, is um, it's just kind of do both uh, because graphics jobs are, are just a little more niche. There's not, not as much of them. Um, either um, you can attack in both ways. Like for, for me, part of it was finding a niche, uh, which is this mapping uh, industry, which was the, within computer graphics um, and focusing on that and getting good at that. Uh, and then the other way is I tried to also focus on building uh, my skills in in just making web apps in general, but also data visualization, because data visualization is 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 more broad. Like not not all data visualization is computer graphics, um, but a lot of a lot of it can be. Um, and so if I can do that, then you know maybe I can find a job that's it's kind of adjacent to computer graphics and and, and kind of move uh, move towards that. Um, so. So that's kind of my advice, and then I'll I'll go over that more uh, in a bit. So, cool. I think we're ready to to make a three D application. Um, okay. So if you if you have the slides, and uh, Tyler posted these on Slack, um, starting in slide twelve here. Um, <clears throat> so what we're gonna do here is is I'm just gonna set up. I mean, this scene is already set up. Um, we're gonna look at a a basic template of a three JS. Uh, scene. And so what is 3JS? 3JS is a library, JavaScript library, uh, for making 3D applications uh, on the web. And it uh, itself uses uh, WebGL. So remember, WebGL was the API that I was telling you about. Um, that is, that's how any application that is on the web that wants to use the GPU, it has to be using WebGL. Um, so 3JS just gives us a few things. Um, well, it actually gives you a lot of things built on top of WebGL just to make it a, a little uh, easier. Uh, to use. And we're going to make some, um, we're going to look at this and then we're going to learn how to uh, actually add in our own 3D model from Sketchfab. Um, and then we're going to look at how to um, apply a custom uh, material. And so this last part is going to be the part uh, that is a lot more like the low level computer graphics that I was talking about, because that's where you actually start to think about, um, or you actually start to have control over uh, how the light, as an example, like um, reacts uh, when it hits a certain material. Um, yeah, okay, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing, if you, so this is also on Glitch, if you haven't used Glitch before, um, the first thing you wanna do is is uh, hit uh, Remix. Uh, and this works even if you're not logged in. Uh, and what this does is it'll give you the ability to run the app and um, and and edit, edit the code. Um, so I'm going to, move to the one that I already remixed here. I'm just going to refresh. And uh, just to make sure that you can run it, you'll see a preview button in the bottom left. Uh, yes, yeah, see once this loads. You'll see the preview button and you can, uh, if it's closed, it's, it'll start out closed and you can click uh, open in preview pane to see it. And once it loads, you should see uh, a black scene with a, with, a, with a little 3D model of a ship here. Uh, and here I can zoom in, I'm zooming in with my mouse wheel and I can left click uh, to rotate uh, and I can right click to kind of drag around. Um, so if we take a look at the code running this, I mean, the first thing I'm doing is in the HTML, I'm just loading uh, 3GS as a library. Um, and I am setting up the 3GS scene uh, here. I just got a question about, will we share these links and the slides? Uh, they should be in Slack. Um, so you should have access to them and, and we can post them again. Uh, if people uh, haven't seen them. Um, <clears throat> so here, here the top part, I'm just setting up the, I'm initializing a scene with, with, with 3JS as a library. I'm setting the camera position uh, here. Um, and then I'm, I'm creating the, um, the camera controls. This is what allows me to click and, and rotate and be able to zoom in and stuff. And the first thing that you can sort of try here is actually moving um, the, the, the ship. Um, so the ship is added, uh, is actually added down here below to the scene. Um, but you have this object in 3D and it has a position. So you can say something like ship.position.x uh, and you can just say, actually let's do Z. And you can just add every frame to it, 0 0.05. And if we do that, we'll see the ship starts moving in the Z direction. And I can change that to the X. You can see moving that way and on the Y, and you can see it moving up, up here. Um, we do something fun, and um, this isn't something that you would normally. Well, 
So I'm going to make the ship kind of uh, rotate uh, back and forth. And I'm using a, a cosine function here. And if you, as you start learning about graphics programming, you'll see this pattern um, uh, a lot of using a cosine when you want something to, to go back and forth because a cosine or a sine is a periodic function. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't really matter too much um, other than like, don't let like the cosine kind of uh, scare you if you, if you if you don't like thinking about trigonometry. We're not really thinking of it as, as trigonometry here. We're just thinking of it as something that uh, we know that this cosine, this function, is going to give us a number uh, from negative one to one. And as we increase this counter, um, it'll, it'll oscillate. Um, so if I set the, the rotations, this is what I'm doing. I'm setting the rotation, let's zoom in a bit, um, on the z-axis. Um, like, actually, just to make it more clear, like, if I if I just added... Uh, you know, put zero one. It'll just it'll just you know rotate by constant value. So, uh, but I want it to kind of go back and forth. So I'll I'll use a use a cosine instead. Um, and uh, but I, I don't want the value to be from negative one to one. I want the value to be a little smaller. And and I you know I didn't know this ahead of time. What I did to to do this is I just added a cosine and I saw okay this this is rotating. You know, too much. So I'll 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 want to make it a little smaller. So maybe I'll just divide by half. And I see. Okay, it's nice. And actually, maybe it's a little slow. So maybe I want to make counter go a little faster. So yeah, it's nice. Maybe maybe just make it for the for this demonstration a little faster. And then I can see the you know it's it's still rotating a bit too much. So I just made it a quarter instead of a half. And so that's that's how I got like, an effect like this, where you you can imagine it's like a boat on the on the water, and it's just kind of uh, bobbing back and forth like that. Um, okay, so that, that's a, a little bit of uh, manipulation on a three D object in in a three D scene. Um, and one one thing that's nice about using something like three JS here is a lot of what we're learning here um, is translates um, to any other engine and uh, and just any three D environment in general. Um, this idea of uh, having um, uh, initializing the scene, setting the camera position, and then given an object, uh, you can manipulate uh, it in 3D space uh, by setting its position or rotation uh, like this. These are all things that, um, you know, if, if you start using Unity, you, you'll notice uh, it's the same, same principles that can apply. Um, so, so that's why I kind of like um, this as, as an example. Here. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is, is how to work with 3D models. Um, so well, one kind of one really useful thing to know is where do you where, where do people get 3D models in general? Um, and a really good resource for that is Sketchfab. Um, so if you just go to Sketchfab, um, it's basically a, repos a, a website where people uh, make and share these 3D models. Uh, some of them uh, people can sell, so you can buy these models. Uh, a lot of them are free. Um, so if you go, if you search for anything like, you know, car, and then you say, I want it to be downloadable. It's not all of them you can download. Uh, you'll see a lot of them. I think the ones that have this icon are store models. Um, and then other ones okay, are, are free. Um, so you can pick any one. I, I, I kind of have one picked out here uh, that we can test with, um, which is this, this little spaceship. Um, so we're going to learn how to take this and actually put it in our application. So, uh, and you'll need to download this, you'll need to log in and you can just log in with your like, Gmail or, or anything. Um, and then once you're logged in, you can come back to this link and this link is in the slides here. Um, and then you can download it. And we're gonna download the, the GLTF uh, version. And, and GLTF as a, as a, is a file format for 3D models in the same way that there are multiple file formats for uh, images, you can have a, a JPEG image, you can have a PNG image, or you can have a, a GIF or a GIF. Um, we're going to be using GLTF. Uh, it, it's 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 a good standard um, to use uh, here. So <clears throat> so you if you, if you once you download it um, and if you unzip it, you'll see um, there are it comes in as as a couple of different files and uh, the textures are are are, um, are put separately. Uh, in order to load this in our scene. Um, because we're using Glitch, um, we need to combine these into a single, into a single file. Um, we can do this using a tool uh, like, like this, um, online GLTF to GLB converter. A, a GLB is just a binary GLTF. It's still a GLTF file. 
Um, so what you would do here is uh, just drag and drop these three, all, all the files, the scene.gltf, the scene.bin, and the textures uh, all together um, here, and then you convert, and then you'll download. And again, we're only we'll need to do this because of uh, how GL, how how glitch how glitch serves the files. Um, it's not necessary, but it does help. Like once we have once you have a single file, it's just easier to upload and, and use in the code here. Um, so once you do that, and then once it finishes converting, you'll download it here, and then back in Glitch uh, to to put it. Uh, and I've already uploaded here. Um, you will you will go on your assets, and then you would just drag and drop it uh, here to upload it. Now, when, once you have your GLB file uh, here, so this this boat is the original one that in here the scene.glb is the ship, the spaceship. Um, so I'm just going to copy this URL. I'm going to go back to the script, and I'm going to replace uh, place the URL here on line 46, and you'll see it updates with the new model that, that we just picked. Um, and so this is how, what you just did is kind of, you, you've seen the whole workflow from, from where, where do people find the, um, the uh, when you find the 3D models, uh, whether it's something like Sketchfab, or you can make them yourself with the Blender or 3D Max or, or any of those tools. Um, and then oftentimes you need to convert it. Uh, Blender itself will have a way to export a GLB file. Uh, if you're if you're getting the model from somewhere else, you may have to convert it yourself. And then once you converted it, uh, you need somewhere to host it. In this case, we're hosting on Glitch. And then finally, uh, we can load it uh, in our 3GS scene um, using the GLTF loader, which loads it and then adds it to the scene. Cool. Okay. So, so now we have this. Um, Let's do, uh, what is it, the final thing? Uh, we can actually uh, look at the custom material. So this is gonna seem a bit, um, what's the word? Um, a bit of a black box because I don't have, uh, we don't have enough time to go over uh, a lot of the, um, the fundamentals of, of exactly what's going on here, uh, but, but bear with me a bit here. So we have, we have a custom material, this function called make custom material. And there's, uh, it contains two pieces of code. Uh, one is called a vertex shader and one is called a frag shader. And these two pieces of code um, are pieces of code that run on the GPU. Uh, so this is not JavaScript. Um, it's not, it looks like C, language C, but it's not, it's, it's slightly different. Uh, it's actually, um, it's called GLSL. It's open GL shading language. And what is the shading language or what is a shader? I've been using this word. Uh, it just means um, a function, a piece of code that runs on the GPU. Uh, that's all it means. Uh, why is it called a shader um, or shading language? That's because traditionally when in the early beginnings of, of computer graphics, uh, the only reason you would write code on a GPU was mainly um, to uh, define, uh, define a material, to define how your material should respond to light, like how, how, the, sh how the shading should happen. Um, but right now, but these days, like you can write, the GPU can do a lot of things, including a lot of work in like machine learning, like really any, anything that's uh, parallelizable, um, you can run on GPU. Uh, but, but for historical reasons, it's still called a, called a shader. Okay, so we have these two shaders. Uh, there are two functions. Uh, one of them is responsible for setting the color of the model. Uh, that's the frag shader at the bottom of here. The other one is responsible for um, transforming the model uh, vertices, uh, the model geometry. Um, so let's look at the, the frag one, the fragment shader, or often also sometimes called the pixel shader. Um, this is a function that just returns a color. So I, I have a line that's commented out here. Um, if, you, if you put that in, it'll turn the whole thing red uh, because this is the color, it's, a, it's four numbers red green blue and alpha so if i you know instead have make the blue component one and the zero uh, wait rg no this is the green component it's so it's rgb um so you know this turns it to green um what, what this thing is doing by default is instead of setting the whole thing to a, to a specific color um it is it's it's grabbing the the color from an image here the image is called map and then putting it on the 3D model. 
And what this image is, you can actually see when, when you downloaded the model, uh, we can actually open it. It's just a PNG. Uh, this is what this is what it looks like. Um, this so the shader of the GPU is what translates between this model, this image, which has all the pieces of the of the, of the model, but they're all kind of you know broken up and they kind of fit in this in this little square image uh, and maps it into onto the 3D model. And how does it map it? Um, it's using this this uh, this UV value, so we can actually visualize this. And and this is actually a good example of what um, what you often have to do if you want to debug something. There's no way that we can print if we wanted to see what values are in here. Uh, you can't print it. The GPU can't print things to the to like the console, uh, but it, it can put things on the screen. So if you want to debug something, you have to put it as a color that is output to the screen so you can look at it. Um, so this is this is what I just did here. Um, and actually, maybe make it a little easier to, to interpret. I'm just going to visualize one piece of it, which is the X. So what's happening here? Um, I'm looking at the value of this variable on the model, and I can see well, what's going on. I have a red towards the, towards the right side, and then it goes to like black uh, towards the left here. And that means that the value is one on the right, and it slowly transitions to zero um, uh, at the end. And, and the similar thing I think will happen with the Y. But you can see actually the Y, um, the Y is different. The Y has its value of one in the middle of the model, and then it goes to zero on both ends of it uh, towards the wings. Um, so so this, this, is the, this is the mapping. Um, this is this is the value that tells the model where where on the ship am I, and so if I'm on the wings, uh, I need to go get the, the that pixel from the image that corresponds to the wings, uh, and and so on. So so that, that's an example of the debugging uh, a value on the on the in the, in the, on the GPU. Um, oh, let, so let, let's look at the 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 vertex shader, the one that manipulates the geometry. Uh, this one is pretty fun because um, it can. Um, in addition, so this one was just changing the color. This one actually changes the geometry. And so, why why do we have something that changes the geometry? Um, the reason is because um, the most basic thing you want to do here is uh, move the camera. Um, unlike in the real world, uh, when you move uh, your camera in in a, in a computer screen. Um, like the screen itself never moves. So what you need to do is you, move, you need to move everything else. So the, the whole world has to move when the camera moves um, just because that's how, um, you know, that, that, that's how a virtual environment works. Um, so, so this is actually what's happening here. Um, these, these matrices, in addition to, uh, like you can think of it, one, one big thing they do is they, they take this view matrix, uh, which encodes the position of the, Encodes the transformation needed to happen um, based on the relative to the camera, um, and yeah, there, there's a good article on this. Uh, if you if you look up like model view projection, uh, which is which is the name of the matrices that are happening here, uh, there's good articles explaining uh, what needs to happen. Um, yeah, I'll I'll just show you a, a fun thing here. So, <clears throat> so. What, what what's happening here is we start out this position that comes in. This is the this is the the the, the, the position of the model geometry uh, in in world space. Uh, so this is what it what, where where it is in the world, and then at the end geo position, that's the position on the screen. Okay, so um, how do we sort of validate that? Um, we can do that by 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 shifting these positions. So if I take the position that's that's coming in as an input. And say move it by uh, let's start by one. Let's try five here. Well, oh, that was too much. Yeah. So you can see what's happening here is that the model uh, is moving um, in the direction and up relative to the model itself. So that makes sense. Now let's see. Let's see what happens if I move the GL position. Um, here. So 
this is interesting. You'll see not much is happening uh, when you change it. Um, when you, if you change the Z, that's because uh, by the, by this point we've we've converted the the geometry to a, to a point on the screen. It's no longer in three D. Um, this is what the projection is doing. Uh, it has to put it on on the screen, sort of flatten it uh, on the screen. And this is sort of what this article explains here, where you start out, you have these cubes and they're in, they're in world space, but then when you want to put them on screen, um, you you essentially kind of flatten them um, because we're we're displaying them on a two D screen at the end of the day. Uh, but something we can do that's interesting. Okay, well, we can't change the Z because there's no because it's already collapsed in 2D, but we can change the X, right? And if we do that, we should be able to, you know, see it uh, move. Um, not so it's, now it's not moving relative to its location; uh, it's moving relative to the screen, um, to the center of the screen. Um, so, okay, so we, we can do things a lot more interesting here. So uh, this is where really the power of computer graphics comes in. Um, we have control over uh, the whole geometry. We can write any, any code here and it'll run on the GPU and it'll, it'll run for every, um, for every vertex uh, here. So uh, if you remember, we could try to do what we did earlier by moving the ship back and forth, um, but we can do it in the shader. So let's try that initially. Um, I'm just gonna move it by a sign. I have a time variable. Okay, and it's moving, and maybe I'll make it a little faster. Um, right. Okay, cool. So that, that's moving up and down. So, so far, no, nothing, nothing too crazy. But the really interesting thing here is that I don't have to move uh, the model vertices by a constant amount. Uh, I can... Um, I can change the, the, the speed based on where I am in the model uh and if you remember how do we know where i am in the model well we we figured that out we have this we have a value it's called the, the vuv uh which is one in the center and and zero uh, at the end so uh, what i want to do here is i want to make the ship move up and down more um maybe just to keep it simple more towards more in the center uh than in the end or, or we could do it the other way around um so let's try this so so if I um, let's see if I if I change this to like 0.5, that means it'll it'll, it'll move a smaller amount. Uh, but if instead of this I multiply by the uv dot uh, y, so now you can see it's 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 moving up and down, but it moves more in the middle uh, than it does on the wings. The wings are stable. Uh, I can actually flip this around. That'd be one minus this. And now, now it kind of looks like a bird, I guess, because now I have uh, the the wings move a lot and the center doesn't move much. Um, we can do something even more fun. And I have this comment out here uh, where I am, I mean, again, I'm doing a similar thing here, um, but I just have this um, additional time. Uh, so it looks like it's kind of doing a wave here. Uh, you can do this on the y axis as well. Which is fun. Uh, and so what we're doing here is again we're we're using the GPU to distort to apply a function because it already does this. It already uh, has a function that runs on all the geometry in order to to move it as the camera moves. Um, but we're we're doing it. We're we're writing a custom shader, a custom function on the GPU to say, well, we don't just want to move it to the camera. We also want to manipulate the geometry. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're bending and uh, twisting the the, the model. Um, so that's kind of an example of what, so a cool thing that you can do uh, with, uh, with 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 a custom material, a uh, custom function that runs on the GPU. And and oftentimes a lot of what we're doing as as graphics programmers is um, is writing these new materials. Um, yeah, and and I was gonna say like a a big thing in the last like five or ten years of of computer graphics is materials that respond uh, more realistically to light. Um, and, and you can imagine a lot of it happens in, in, in here in these vertex shaders or, or, or and, and fragment shaders. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so just a quick review. Uh, what do you now know, um, given, uh, given this, these slides and this, this demo? Um, you have a template if you want to set up a basic uh, 3D scene on a web page. And, and again, this is just all HTML. You can take this and embed it on a website or, or anything. 
uh, or embedded in the web app. Um, you know a good place to find 3D models, that's Sketchfab. You also know um, what GLTF is as a file format, and that's it's a common file format for 3D models. You know how to uh, work with it. You know how to convert it uh, into a single GLB file that you can load into an application. Um, you also know how to you know manipulate a 3D model both um, as um, by manipulating like its its position and rotation, uh, but also by having this custom material that can change um, the, the color on the model, uh, but also its, its geometry. Uh, and, you, and you know how to do this by writing a function that runs on the GPU. Um, so this is the first time you've written a shader. Congrats, this is the first code you've ever written uh, that runs on a GPU. Um, and, and it's really not running on the, on the CPU, um, which I think is cool um, because it's such a different kind of part of computer science that a lot of times you don't, you don't get, to, get to see. Okay, um, so wrapping up here, um, I talked about this a little bit at the beginning. Um, I think it's worth, uh, if, if this is a field you're interested in, um, I think it's worth uh, keeping an eye out on, on, on job postings and opportunities um, because um, there's, there are more out there than you might think. I mean, it, it's still obviously less than general software engineering jobs like building web apps. Um, but I think kind of I think it's it's possible to kind of uh, do both to kind of um, build your general software engineering skills while also um, uh, building these these more uh, specific computer graphic skills. And actually, one thing that I don't have on here, which is probably the best advice, uh, is um, you can volunteer for SIGGRAPH. So again, I mentioned SIGGRAPH is this um, the, the world's biggest computer graphics conference. Um, it is expensive to go to. Uh, generally, people are are part of a company as an employee. Uh, the company will generally pay for the ticket. Uh, as a student, though, um, you can volunteer. They have a volunteer program. You can apply, it and then you'll be able to go for free. Uh, and volunteering will actually help you network and, and get to know people. And and this is a great way to actually learn about uh, job opportunities and and then just go to talks and then see what what other kind of jobs there are. So that's probably maybe the number one thing if you're really interested in this to, to look out for. It. Uh, how to just Google SIGGRAPH volunteering uh, to look into that. Um, and other than that, I'm really just, just making stuff. Um, I have a few links to tutorials here. One of these is one uh, I've written. Another one is uh, one that takes you through, um, basically like if you took a computer graphics class in like, you know, uh, Stanford or Harvard or whatever, um, it'll, it'll probably, uh, it, it, like doing this little online course, uh, which is just like, you know, nine, eight, nine lessons here. Uh, we'll, we'll teach you a lot of the computer graphics fundamentals uh, because I, I didn't have computer graphics as a as a class that I could take uh, in, in college. Um, but a lot of it I learned online, a lot of it from research like this. Um, so this will teach you like the same fundamentals that, that you might learn um, in, um, in school. So I think that's a good uh, research too. And finally, like the best way to learn is really by uh, being part of community. And so I've learned a lot from like both asking questions and, and trying to answer questions while using 3GS. Um, and because 3 js is open source, and then I can look at the source code for how things are done, so I can learn about how WebGL works, and that's kind of how I got um, into um, you know, the working with WebGL and then doing those kinds of jobs. Um, all right, and that's it. I'm done exactly on time. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, yeah, I'm on the code day Slack, and, and you have my website uh, in the slides here if you have any questions or if you want to reach out. Well, thank you so much for that very uh, in-depth and awesome uh, talk. I cannot imagine how long that must have taken you to prepare. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks, all.